There are message notes in your worship guide if you want to follow along. And I'm going to take my time getting into this this morning because context is everything. Say that with me. Context. Yeah. If somebody passes you a note that says Jesus loves you in church, that means one thing. Now, if you're in a Mexican prison, <laughs> took you a second, huh, Doc? <laughs> Context is everything. <laughs> so, so come back, come back. It's all right. It's all right. Um, you, you need to know the context of what Jesus is talking about because people take these particular verses in the Sermon on the Mount out of context all the time. So let me take you back to the start. We have been in the series, the Sermon on the Mount or the Jesus way for a whole bunch of weeks and we're going verse by verse through Matthew chapter five and six and seven. And he starts it off by, by saying, God blesses people who recognize their need for him. In other words, he says this to people who decide to climb higher with him. Like he saw the crowds coming, but then he decided to climb a mountain and only those who wanted to hear what he had to say climb. Not everybody wants to climb higher. Not everybody wants to elevate. But those who are willing to grow and to, and say, I don't know what he's got for me, but I need to hear what he has to say. They came higher. And he, he sat down and he began to teach them. Blessed are those who recognize their need for him. And I've been going verse by verse through all of these Beatitudes. You remember the first one is just this sense of, I need to get close to God, like I'll climb higher. And there are some people though who don't get that. Their whole attitude is, I'm fine just where I am. Like y'all go, but I'm good where I'm at. Then he says, blessed are those who recognize that things need to change that there's something wrong with the way things are in the world. And some people would just say, nothing needs to change, it's fine. And then he talks about, blessed are those who realize they need to change, like I need to change, something's wrong with my life. And the Pharisees and the self-righteous, they're like, me change? No, they need to change. And so many people today are pointing the finger at other people when God's just saying, would you look at your own life? Is there nothing that needs to change? <laughs> And then Jesus calls his disciples, listen, if you'll just go all the way in, seek righteousness and mercy, because you all have been forgiven from a lot, go after both of those. That takes some humility, because I need God, I wanna do right, but I also know I'm, I've got a lot going on in my life that I need mercy. He says, that's the right posture, but the self-righteous, the Pharisee, they, they were like, wait a second, I don't need to change, I'm doing it right, I'm good. I, I'm following the letter of the law. Now you need to understand that Jesus didn't come after people in the world to convict them. Notice, Jesus always comes for the people of God first. Like all the prophets God sent to the nation of Israel all through time, he said, I'm coming to call the righteous back. Jesus says, I was sent for the lost sheep of Israel. Not that he's not there for lost people, he just says my priority first is to call the people who should know better, the people who've drifted, the people who've gotten off track. The self-righteous, the Pharisees were like, wait a second, we're fine, what's wrong? Why are you pointing at us? And Jesus wasn't just a prophet like all the other prophets. I love what Dr. John Piper said. He said that Jesus was not just another member in the long line of wise men and prophets. He was the end of the line, like he came to fulfill what all the other prophets had been saying. So here's what he says, remember, let me just review you. He's saying, hey, everybody climb higher, elevate, things have to change, wait, no, I need to change. Okay, I'm gonna go all in. This is the, in, the essential starting place of the Sermon on the Mount because who we are becoming is more important than just what we're doing. And the self-righteous people are always trying to point out what are you doing and what are you not doing? And Jesus says, can I elevate you above that? I'm trying to help you become a child of God. I wanna help you become like God. So rise above the do's and the don'ts and the lists of the laws. I wanna I want help you become somebody new. 
That's why he goes on to say right after the Sermon on the Mount or the, the Beatitudes, he says, I didn't come to abolish the law. Don't think I'm a lawbreaker. Don't think I'm calling you to break laws. I'm coming to fulfill the law. And that made the self-righteous Pharisees very cranky because they thought they heard, wait, you're trying to cancel the law? He goes, no, 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 I'm not trying to abolish it. I'm just trying to fulfill it. Let me put it to you this way. Jesus brings about the designated conclusion of everything the law and the prophets said. Not that there was something wrong with what they were doing. They were just temporary. The Old Testament was pointing towards what Jesus would accomplish. It wasn't canceled, it was just concluded. It wasn't abolished, it was just now obsolete according to Hebrews 8.13. And so not because again the rules, the commands, the instructions, the practices were wrong, but just they were all pointing to the day where Jesus would become the sacrifice for all sin. And it's so important that you understand this, that Jesus doesn't come to put you back under the law again. He's come, to, he's come to fulfill the law and he brings freedom. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I'm the way you get to God. And so then he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the guys who are keeping it to the letter, Unless you're right, if, if you want to go that, right, right, uh, that route, fine, but you're going to have to do better than those guys. And everybody was shocked because we can't do what the Pharisees are doing. And the Pharisees were offended because, wait, you're saying there's something wrong with what we're doing? So everybody's offended now. And Jesus says, no, you got to do better than the, law, than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees because if you don't do better than them, you're not going to make it. And then he says six You've heard what Moses said, but I say statements to which they were upset about. Like, who do you think you are? Moses gave us the law. And Jesus said, I know, I know. You heard, you've heard it said, but I say to you. If, if you, you heard it said, don't murder. But I say to you, if you have hate in your heart, it's like you murdered somebody. It's like, that's where the sin begins in the heart. And then you heard last week, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Well, I tell you that if you have lust in your heart, like your eyes get involved, you start taking matters into your own hands, you're guilty. You're just, it might as well, you are, you're committing the adultery in your heart. And that really offended everybody. And so today we come to this next phrase where he talks about divorce. And I have to give you the context, because if you don't see the context, you'll think he's just talking about divorce. And he's not. He's talking about self-righteous people who refuse to see what God is trying to do, who, want, who don't want to listen to God. And he uses these things like adultery, divorce. He's going to talk about an eye for an eye or breaking your word or, or hating your enemies. You've heard it said, hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies. Jesus is elevating people above the law. So he's using these things as, as examples. But his whole point, the context is self-righteous people. Something's got to change. You can't keep living that way. I'm calling you higher. And so the self-righteous people were just getting madder and madder and trying to pick him apart. So let's get into this today. You guys ready? This is, the, this is so interesting. The whole point Jesus is making with these six statements, he's trying to say, you think you're right, you just have to get right with God and obey his laws and you can treat people the way you want to treat them? Oh no, you can't treat. The way you treat people reveals your love for God. Don't say you love God and then treat people the wrong way. So he elevates the horizontal equal to the vertical. We talked about that a few weeks ago. So he's saying the way you treat your brother, the way you treat women, and Jesus is revolutionary in his views about women. He elevates women like nobody else. The ancients, they didn't put, practice this. Aristotle, hundreds of years before Jesus, he says women were a mistake when God was trying to make men. And so, yeah, that's what they believed. And, and then women prior to Jesus were just commodities. They're just objects for pleasure, for sex, for procreation of, of creating as many children. And, and in the Old Testament, the heroes just find one of them who lays down his life for his wife. Doesn't exist. The Old Testament is all about people laying down the law with their wives. But Jesus says, no, 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 I'm coming to elevate you to lay down your life for your wife. And then he, he starts declaring things like women are going to be joint heirs and partners in the gospel. 
Join heirs with Jesus. Join heir. And then he says, the Holy Spirit will be given to all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. He begins to elevate women to a place that nobody had before. The world was different before Jesus came everywhere. And so Jesus is elevating women. And so these Pharisees who were so self-righteous, they despise women like everybody else. So you need to know that that is the context of these verses right here. If you don't know that context, you'll get the message wrong. Look what he says next. He says, furthermore, it's been said. I know Moses said this. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, and they're like, what? You can't contradict Moses. And see, Moses had said, if you wanna divorce your wife, you can give her a certificate of divorce. So the rabbis had come around and had made all these applications. They had commentaries. Rabbi Hillel was the most ancient and the most prolific of all the rabbis. And he said, you could divorce your wife based on Moses' instructions. You could divorce your wife for any reason at all. Any reason. Bad cooking was a reason. <laughs> you burned the biscuits, gone. You undercooked the chicken, out of here, gone. It wasn't just cooking. You roll your eyes, gone. You show disrespect, out. So the rabbi made all of these rules. And so all you had to do was go to the rabbi, get a certificate of divorce. Some of them would get it in advance and just keep it in their pocket. <laughs> I'm serious. You can Google this. This is not, I'm, it was, it was the way they kept control. And it's like, all they had to do was whip that thing out and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. That was it. And then the woman would be out and they would move on. They had no conviction in their hearts about trading in what they had for the better model. None at all. And so, they're, so, so Jesus is saying, you, all, you self-righteous dudes, you think that you've not committed adultery. You think you have no murder in your heart. You think that you, the way you treat women and with your little divorce certificate in your pocket. So he's mocking them, okay? He's saying, you've heard it says, put this back up here. You've heard it says, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual morality causes her to commit adultery. Why? Well, because, because if she's committed sexual immorality, she's committed adultery. But if, if you just divorce her, divorce her, then you're causing her to do this. See, this is about, you've, you've given no thought to your actions, what you're, what you're causing, what, what you're creating. You see, what happens when a woman is divorced in that time? She loses everything, her house, her income. There's no social security. There's no, she's lost her respectability. She's lost her standing in the community. She's lost her reputation. She has, her children, all the, all the children are now orphans. So they're, so they're unprotected. And so the children's lives are in total havoc. They're probably good as dead. And she has nothing. The only way she can hope to survive is to find somebody who will marry her again. And he say, y'all think that just because you have a certificate, a piece of paper, that you can dissolve what God has called indissolvable? And look what, the, look what, the, look what you do to others. Look what you've done to this woman. Look what you do to her children. So the Pharisees don't like this at all. They don't like being called out. They come at him over this, not just here, but throughout the book of Matthew. And I love this. Sometimes one of the ways you interpret scriptures when you don't understand them, well, what else does the Bible have to say about the same thing? So Jesus gets asked by the Pharisees in chapter 19 of, of Matthew. They come at him again. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him. Because he said, I didn't come to abolish, I came to fulfill. So they're trying to get him to say something that would make him a lawbreaker. So he, they, they come trying to test him saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Of course, we cringe. <laughs> like really, any reason at all. Any of the stuff that I talked about, they're saying, Moses said we could do that. The rabbi said we could do that. They have no conviction coming to Jesus Basically saying, Jesus, you tell us, what are the proper procedures for trading out one wife for another? 
And they have no conviction about that at all. So Jesus says, you don't understand. Moses, I wanna go back. Let me go back to the, first, to the first verse a second. I think I forgot something. Go back to Matthew chapter five. Yeah. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual morality causes her to commit adultery. Okay, go back to chapter 19 again. He answered them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. So he takes them back to, here's what God was really intending all along. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one. God says, I'm gonna put them together and that union that they have, they're gonna become one person. They're no longer two, but they're one flesh. Therefore, what God joins together let no man separate. So Jesus is elevating it back to the ideal of God. And they were like, well, that's crazy. I mean, how, how, how could anybody live that way? And I mean, all they had seen in their whole lives was marriages coming apart. They had seen divorces. They had seen people committing adultery. They would stone, you know, someone caught in adultery. And typically it was only the woman because she had no rights. So Jesus comes along and elevates, brings them back to the higher standard. God intended all along that you should remain together, that you shouldn't separate. Then they said, well, then why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce? Why did he make the provision? Why can't we just put her away? Like he said. And he said to them, Moses, because of the, say it with me, hardness of your hearts. That's the big idea. See, it always goes back to the heart. Because of the hardness of your heart, he permitted you to divorce your wives, but that's not what God intended from the beginning. You can't just, no, there's no certificate that can dissolve the indissolvable union. So he goes back and he repeats again what he said before in Matthew 5. He says, I tell you, except whoever, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual morality, marries another commits and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her commits adultery. In other words, you're not thinking about the impact. You're not thinking about the ripping and the tearing and the bruising and the cruelty and the, the impact that, that children are, are going to have. You're, you're not paying attention to this. And I think about all the times now when I stand up in front of a young couple and I lead them in a marriage and I say that phrase, who God has joined together, let no one separate. And I don't think people know what I'm talking about. They think that's just part of the ceremony, but you know, they're standing there and a lot of people are just thinking, well, I've just got, I got that divorce certificate in my back pocket just in case I, I need it later. And all, all Jesus is saying is, look, that's not the way it was supposed to be. God's view of it in the beginning was two people would come together and they would stick together and they'd be together for the rest of their lives. Now, I feel the tension in the room right now because people are going, well, how could anybody live that way? And that's exactly what happened in this scripture right here. Go on to the next verse. The disciples said, well, if that's the case, if God, if God meant it to be one person married to one person for the rest of their lives, well, who could ever do that? That's impossible. All we've ever seen is marriages coming apart and marriages failing and people trading in and all of this. This is just the norm. And they said, maybe it's better that nobody gets married at all. Wasn't that, that just sound like today? And Jesus said, yeah, I know. All, nope, not everybody can accept this. Watch this. Only those whom God helps. What was the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? God blesses those who recognize their need for him. If you don't think you need God, if you think you can just make this on your own, there's no way. All you really have is the divorce courts because there's no way it's gonna work. There's nothing harder in this world than putting two people together, two sinners, two backgrounds, two histories, two personalities, two wounded natures, uh, two sets of uh, agendas. You put them together and think that that's just gonna all work out. 
It does, it's hard. It does, anybody who's made it had God's help. I thank God. I've been married to this woman over here, Lurie, for 32 years. <laughs> By the grace of God. And we said we would never divorce. Murder we thought about a couple of times. <laughs> it ain't easy. Anytime you look at, and I'm not, that's, no, that's nothing. There's people here, you've been together a lot longer than that. My father-in-law is right here, 57 years married. My, my mom and dad, 55 years this year married. And y'all, I've been inside the house. I grew up with these people and they can fight. <laughs> Miss Janice and Pastor Don look like such precious little beautiful. Oh, Jesus. My mother, my dad, they can go at it. Don't let them fool you. And my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, let me tell you a story. One time she's packing the suitcases and he starts packing his suitcase saying, all right, I'm going with you because you ain't leaving me here with these kids. You know, it's... <laughs> it ain't easy, Doc. It's hard. It's hard. It's just because, because you have two people trying to make it work and, and, and there's a word that is at the root of all of it, and it's just called irritation. <laughs> Y'all, people can irritate you, and that's where all this, long before there's a divorce, in the heart, irritation starts. So I don't want you to hear this message today. Let, let there be no tension in the room. First of all, divorce is not the impartable sin, and God forgives every sin, and all of us needed grace. Listen, if he elevated Context, context. Two verses before, he says, if you have lust in your heart, you committed adultery. By that definition, every last one of us have been unfaithful. And that's where God comes in. God looked at us in our unfaithfulness because we committed adultery or idolatry when we pursued other gods than God. We chased other things. We've, we've, we've pursued. So Jesus is not coming down on the person who goes, oh God, I need you, forgive me. God's not coming down on that person. God, God will never reject the humble. What, God, what Jesus coming after is self-righteous people who are like, look at how good I am and I don't need you. And God's coming after that heart because that's the heart. See, humility is the heart of God and pride is the heart of the devil and that'll take you down the road. So he's coming after the self-righteous people who were keeping the letter of the law, but their hearts looked like a different father than God. The way you behave always reveals something about who your father is. And so Jesus was just saying, look, there's a better way. And I know there's a lot of controversy about this issue. Some people will look at divorce and they'll, they'll just cherry pick these verses out and they'll make a whole case about what people are supposed to do today. I, listen, I can't tell you what to do because this is one of those things that's called a disputable matter in scripture. It's not at the elevation of essentials. For example, the Roman Catholic Church says no, no divorce ever. And then you have some people who would say, well, no, our church says that in the case of sexual immorality, Jesus said that it's okay. And then there's other people who will say, oh, well, there's a whole bunch of other things besides sexual immorality as well. You're going to have to do some research for yourself and decide for yourself because we don't divide over this issue in this church. We don't, we don't stop people from being a member in this church based on their marital status. And we don't deny leadership in this church based on someone's marital status. It's a disputable matter. All I would say to you, my job is to teach you what the scriptures say. And your job is to, when you face any difficult issue, my hope would be is that you would consider scripture and not just your feelings when you make a decision, okay? But you guys decide. I love this, put this back up on the screen again. I want you to notice this. Not everybody can accept this he said, but God has help for people who are humble. So can I say this now in the context, what, what the, heart, the heart of God has been there all along. Those rabbis, those, those, those people whipping out the certificate of divorce, it's not like Jesus came along with something new, it's always been God's heart. Back in the book of Malachi, it says, God says, I hate divorce. I don't hate divorced people, but I hate divorce because of what it does to people. It rips people. It, shreds people, it just devastates the soul, it, it messes kids up. And so God says, before you run out and just trade out, you need to think about the consequences of it. To divorce your wife, to treat her like she's not a person and just do what you will, is to overwhelm her with cruelty. 
So he says this, he says, guard your heart. See, it's all about the heart. What are you gonna let go in your heart? He's specifically talking about pride and your willingness to hold on to the irritations. Like how long are you gonna keep that sand in your shorts, <laughs> basically? He says, guard your heart, don't be unfaithful to your wife. Well, she was unfaithful to me. She committed adultery. Well, yeah, well, again, by the definition of Jesus, every single one of us has been unfaithful. We all have fallen short of God's standards. So I don't believe, my, my view of the scripture is I don't think Jesus is giving an exception clause for anybody. He's simply saying from the beginning, it was never God's intention. He wanted people to stay together forever. And he's also saying that it's gonna take a lot of grace to do that. And God doesn't reject people. But he says, I've got, I, I want to hold up the standard and say, guard your heart above all else. Watch what Proverbs says, because everything in your life flows out of the heart. This is what he's addressing here. What kind of heart do you have? How's your self-righteousness level? Do you recognize that you're going to need all the help of God to live according to his way? So, he, so Jesus is coming. Basically, he's, he's building a case for his new commandment. Remember, he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill it, and he comes with the new commandment, which, which isn't just another one added on to all the ones in the Old Testament. This is a new commandment that is above all the commandments. This is the fulfilling commandment. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Or said another way, love one another, say it with me, just as I have loved you. How did he love us? Well, he laid down his life for us. While we were in sin, he gave his life. While we were rebelling against him, while we were unfaithful to him, he gave us a gift called grace. Grace, everybody. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ actually laid down his life so that even though, you know, I was in the wrong, I messed up, I was unfaithful, I committed adultery against God, Jesus didn't treat me, he didn't divorce me. He didn't. He came after me. He pursued me. And that picture is all the way through the Bible of how God pursues people who have been unfaithful to him. His, one of his names is, I am the God of unfailing love and faithfulness. Isn't that good news, everybody? So let nobody here be under any condemnation. God will be faithful to you and stick with you and be merciful to you and give you grace upon grace upon grace. Your job is to guard your heart and decide, am I gonna be self-righteous or am I gonna be humble? So I wanna give you, in the last few minutes, how do you make a marriage last? If I've decided to take this commandment and make it the commandment of my life, I'm gonna love just as Christ loved me. Let me break this into two principles for you, which I think are at the root of what holds a marriage together and really is the way we should live our lives towards everybody. Number one, put others first as Christ put me first. That's the amazing thing. He didn't have to, but he did. He put me ahead of his own desires. He said, not my will, but yours be done. So he, he decided to overlook all the things that irritated God, and he, he comes towards us. Like a prodigal who's run away and the father's just longing for that son to come home. Let me give you the way the Apostle Paul wrote it. He says, get rid of all the irritations. Get them out of your heart. Don't let them build up. If you let the irritations build up, that's, divorce is where it's going to go. So get rid of all of the bitterness and the rage and the anger and the brawling and the, and the, the slander, the gossiping, all the malice. Instead, be kind, be compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. There's that phrase again, just as Christ in God forgave you. So just as I loved you, so love one another. This is the new law, the new law of how to live your life. It's not complicated. It's actually less complicated, but it's more demanding and there ain't no loopholes. It's the higher standard. Love and forgive one another. Get rid of those irritations. I love it. Here's another verse the Apostle Paul wrote. So then, if you're going to live this way, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now watch the next verse. Wives, 
to your own husbands as you do the Lord. Notice the word submit is not in that verse. Now in your English Bibles, the word submit is gonna be there, but that's because it's, it's added in to make sense. But in the original language, the word submit, wives submit to your husbands, not, not in the original language. It's only there because of the context of the verse in front. The only reason we know that submit should go in that phrase about wives submit to your husbands is because of the context of the phrase right before where it says submit to one another. Any man leveraging the scripture, wife you ought to submit to me because the Bible says you're wrong, out of context. The, the, the context is y'all submit to one another and then watch what he does, so he breaks it down. He says, so wives, this is how you submit, and husband, this is how you submit. Does that make sense, everybody? Stop saying that, dudes. Because <laughs> you're wrong. It's not the right, that's not the right, that's the, that's the Pharisee heart. That's, that's old covenant thinking. All right, you don't need to say the Bible says. No, stop. He doesn't even, he just says, submit to one another because they deserve it out of reverence for each other? No, out of reverence for Christ. Why? Because Christ gave his life. Watch this, he says, wives, to your own husbands as you do the Lord, so as you submit to God, and then husbands, love your wives, how? Just as Christ loved the church. Well, how did he do that? Are you sure you wanna ask that question? <laughs> he gave his life. He, he, he sacrifices. So, so it's this idea of giving myself for the other, putting the other person first. Actually, that leads to the second principle, which is the principle of mutual submission. This is the big idea. Two people, and this is how you make a marriage last, two people submitting to each other. That's the only way to make it work. Mutual submission only works when it's mutual. So two people saying, I'm gonna put you first, I'm gonna to defer to you. And then the Apostle Paul, I don't have time, but he just, to give you all the scriptures, but he gives a list all the way through uh, his writings, how we're to do that. Well, submit to one another, how? Well, forgive one another. Don't hold on to the irritation, let it go. Encourage one another, restore one another. Accept, accept them, accept their irritating little flaws. Just accept it. You'll just save yourself so much trouble. Just accept them for who they are and then carry one another's burdens. And you can almost hear Jesus in the background behind it all saying, yep, just as I loved you, so you are to love one another. Mutual submission. Now this is why, when you have this idea, this is why the Apostle Paul writes it out this way. So now, when you're thinking this way, that's the reason why you should have no sexual immorality. Not because the Bible says, or because there was some verse back in the Old Testament, because it's not proper for God's holy people, considering what Jesus has done for you. There shouldn't be any sexual morality, no impurity, no selfish ambition or greed. Like get rid of all that in light of what Christ has done for you, how he overlooked your unfaithfulness, you ought to do the same. You were once in the dark, you didn't know better, but now you're in the light of the Lord. So, so, so how should we then live? Well, live like a child of the light. Or in other words, live the way of Jesus. You have a higher way to live. That's, that's why, that's why um, this is such a big idea. Who, who you're becoming, right, is more important than what you're doing. You don't need to worry about getting it all right. Just say, God, I need to put you first. Thank you for your grace. Let me, let, me, let me take you right back to the beginning. Apply this to your marriage, okay? What if, what if we all said there's a higher way to live than just the way of the world? I'm gonna climb higher, I'm gonna elevate my thinking. Now I'm fine where I am, pastor. Well, how about, how about recognizing something needs to change? It's not working the way you've been doing it. Eh, nothing needs to change, I'm, I'm good. No, I, I need to change, I need to change the way I'm doing it. That's the humble way. What, me? No, it's them. No, no, I need to change. How about I go all in? Just for one year of your life, if you went all in saying, God, I'm gonna put the other first and I'm gonna submit myself to their needs. If you did that, it would revolutionize your relationship. 
And some of you have been sitting here today, you're single and you're saying, what does this have to do to, with me? Well, if you ever hope to be married someday, I'm giving you the best advice. Because people are getting married for the wrong reasons today, everybody. They're just looking at the apparel and the abs and the assets, and they're just looking at all the wrong things. <laughs> They're just, they're just looking at the outside. I'm telling you, it's gonna change. Just give it 15 years. Gravity, expansion, <laughs> it's gonna change. So you better have something more than just the outside. You need to come to a higher way and you just say, I'm gonna have to change if this is gonna work. God's desire, honestly, is that divorce would stop among his people. Now I know we're not all there and I know that we've all fallen short, okay. Bottom line, just, just, this is walk away from this day. Don't harden your, your heart. Above all, keep your heart soft. Keep your heart in the place of the one who needs to climb higher. Don't follow the way of the Pharisee. It leads to death. Pride leads to death. I'm gonna leave you with a final illustration. It comes out of nature, actually. It's the oyster. <laughs> the, little, the little clam thing with the two shells. And you know what happens is a grain of sand will get in there and start to irritate. Oh, it's just grinding away and it irritates and it won't come out, can't get rid of it. It's, in, it's lodged. So you know what the oyster does? It starts to put a layer around that little grain of sand. And he puts another layer and another layer and layer upon layer, like grace upon grace grace upon grace, more and more until after a while, there's not the grain of sand anymore. It's all been covered over. And what you have now, instead of a piece of sand, you've got a beautiful pearl, actually a trophy of the grace of God. This is what God has. You will never get rid of all the irritants, but you can decide grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. You guys hear me today? We can do it. God has help for the humble. God has help for the humble. I'm gonna close on that. Let's pray together. God, we hear your voice today. We wanna to rise higher. We wanna elevate, change our hard hearts, lift us up. And uh, Lord, for those who have sitting here today and their marriage is in trouble, God, I pray for them. You have help for the humble. And I pray, Lord, that you would comfort them and give them resolve to not focus on the other, but to focus on themselves and hear what your spirit is saying to them. I pray for healing. I thank you, Lord, that you save. You can save a marriage. Because you save, you heal, you restore, you even redeem our mistakes and our failures. And so God, do it for the marriage that's hurting today. God, give grace to the one who's been divorced and wishes it had a different outcome. God, you have a whole life in front of them. Give them grace for everything that's ahead. I've watched you heal the trauma of children who were separated. I've watched you heal mistakes. I've watched you restore what the enemy meant for evil. You are, you're an amazing God who heals and restores. God, let, let hope arise as we follow you, as we elevate, as we come closer to you. You have a way of changing our lives. And I pray that for your family today. And now I wanna pray for the person who's far from God. You have drifted. You've never really given your life to Christ. You know about God, but you've never surrendered to him. I wanna lead you in a prayer. You can be forgiven. You can start afresh. God can remove all of the shame out of your life. He does not want you living as a prisoner of shame. You can be set free, but you have to recognize that you need God. So I wanna lead you in that prayer. Prayer goes like this. God, I know that I need you. You gotta tell him that. God, I need you desperately. If you're watching at home, say that prayer right where you are. God, I need you. Say this next part. God, I'm so sorry for living without you, for my prideful heart, for my sin, for my mistakes, for my rebellious heart. Forgive me. I was wrong. I'm sorry. And then say this next part. God, I open my heart now to you. I change the direction. I'm going to become your follower. I'm going to listen to your way, what you say. Lead me, be my, be my Lord. Maybe say it this way, God, I give you my whole life. If you're praying this prayer right now, 
Would you just slip your hand up right where you're praying? Just say, Pastor, that's me. Yes, yes, yes. Lift it up. Yep, I see. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, up in the risers, lift it up, put it back down. Yep, I see you. Yes, I got you. God sees you. He sees that humility. That's so good. Yep. Lord, I just lift up all these people who are just humbly saying, God, I need you. God, fill them with your spirit. Thank you for forgiving their sin. Thank you for the fresh start and the new life ahead. I pray that as they follow you, not long from now, they'll look back over their life and not recognize themselves. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God praise, everybody. That's awesome. Great job.